All right, welcome everyone to the 2021 UNC Water and Health Conference. I am Anjadul Islam and I work for the Water Institute. I will be the host for your session today. Thank you so much for joining with us in the poster session today. Before we get started, let's quickly go through some uh, housekeeping announcement. We regularly have a lunch event uh, at afternoon, 12.15 to 1.15 uh, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we also have a networking sessions, which are already happening, uh, which are gonna happen every day, uh, 3.30 p.m. to 5.00 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that will gonna be happening in Remo. And the details of how to register, register and um, how to get participate, you're gonna find the details uh, into uh, the website. Uh, also today we will have a uh, great networking event for young professionals uh, that will gonna happen at 3.30 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, please feel free to join. Uh, we will have a great panelist coming in and they'll get really looking forward to that. Uh, like last year, we are having a late, the late early show. Um, today's late early show is going to happen at around 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, today's discussion will going to be on Southeast Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, Dr. Regina Sauter and Alexander will going to discuss uh, lessons learned from the day and how to apply them in those regions. Now, I'm gonna quickly give some instruction for the session today. Our session is being recorded. Uh, everyone but the presenters will gonna be muted. And please use the chat tab on our conference platform, Pathable, to type in any question for the poster presenters today. Um, I will monitoring the chat. And um, we'll address that when it come when it time comes uh, for the uh, presenters to address those. Also, our presenters already uploaded their files uh, and relevant materials in, under the file tab. So please go ahead and locate there uh, if if you feel like you need uh, more detail about the poster and uh, also the pre-recorded videos uploaded there as well. Now, without wasting any time, I want to introduce our first presenter today. And it will going to be Mimi Alkatan. Uh, she is an environmental engineer uh, in Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, so our, Mary, uh, our technical assistant, Mary Margaret, will gonna uh, play the pre-recorded video from Mimi. Hi, thank you for joining us here today. My name is Mimi Alcaton. I have an MS in civil engineering. I'm currently employed as an environmental engineer at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm going to share here today the study I conducted as part of my master's thesis. The title of the study is Impact of Intermittent Water Supply on Bulk Water Quality and Biofilms. Intermittent Water Supply, or IWS, is defined as a pipe drinking water distribution system that operates for less than 24 hours a day. Water quality is found to be negatively impacted in IWS, which creates a human health risk. There are still many gaps in our understanding of pathways of contamination in IWS, which has been a limitation in creating appropriate solutions to maintain water quality in IWS systems. For our study, we ran an investigation of the impact of intermittency on water quality, biofilms, and water pressure in IWS. Our study consisted of constructing two identical model drinking water distribution systems. One was operated as an IWS and the other as a continuous water supply and as a control. The IWS was operated for six hours a day, two days a week and represented a supply schedule that is commonly found in IWS. Water samples were taken from the IWS when it was first turned on and a simultaneous sample was taken from the continuous water supply at that time. Five minutes later, another water sample was taken from the IWS to measure the changes from when the IWS was first turned on. And then another water sample was taken at the end of the IWS water supply period six hours later. 
to measure the water quality at the end of a supply period. At the same time, another simultaneous sample was taken from the continuous water supply. During the IWS supply period, another sample was taken from the tap water being supplied to both of the systems. The, the physical and chemical water quality parameters we measured were temperature, conductivity, pH, turbidity, total iron, free chlorine, total chlorine, monochloramine, free ammonia, total nitrogen, and TOC. For the biological water quality parameter, we measured CATP. We also measured the biofilms that grew on the inside of the pipe loop um, that grow in all drinking water distribution systems. We also measured the pressure in each of the systems continuously with an online continuous monitoring system. Both of the systems were pressurized. We found a significant decrease in chlorine residual and an increase in turbidity, TOC, and microbial concentration in the water that was first flushed through the IWS pipe loop. However, we found that IWS water quality matched those in the CWS pipe loop or were better over the course of an IWS supply period. We found that the biofilms in the IWS pipe loop before supply period were had a larger spread or thickness than the biofilm sampled after a supply period. And we also found negative pressures in the IWS system. We recommend some improvements that can be made to IWS to maintain water quality. We recommend that the water that's first through, flushed through the IWS system to be better managed. Um, we also recommend higher chlorine residuals um, to be maintained in the IWS system to prevent regrowth of biomass and protect against biological contamination. We also recommend better input water quality in terms of lower turbidity and TOC concentrations. We also recommend higher chlorine residual concentrations in input water quality. Um, we also recommend maintaining IWS systems a little better because we do see that IWS can have negative pressures, especially when they're turned off. And during those times where IWS is experiencing negative pressure, it can draw in fluids from the surrounding area, which can be contaminated and introduce biological and chemical contaminations from the environment into the drinking water distribution system. Thank you very much. Please contact me if you have any more questions and I will answer any questions that I can. Well, thank you so much, Mimi. Uh, can you please share your screen for your poster? Uh, I am actually glad that I was part of this uh, project at some point uh, during the summer. Uh, I visited the pipeline and it looks great. Great work uh, by Mimi and Professor Emily Campbell. Um, please uh, use the Pathable platform for any questions for Mimi. Uh, I have a quick question for you, Mimi. Yeah. Uh, what will be your suggestion for people in developing country who is experiencing most of this intermittent water supply? Do you just instruct them to like, leave the water uh, for like five minutes at the beginning uh, when the water is like so scarce in those settings? Yeah, that's hard because of course, when water is so scarce, you don't want to flush the water um, and it includes an extra step. So what we recommend if the utilities are, aren't, aren't doing the work to maintain these systems and maintain the water quality that households can use household water treatment, um, to help with water store, not only storage, because that's a large part of intermittent water supply, but any use of water for drinking and sanitation that they use at the household. We got a question from Sydney. Uh, can you tell us more about the specific system you are testing and what the source, what the source water was? Thank you, Sydney. So the, I think you're asking a little bit more about the model. So the model uh, distribution system we made, well, we circulated water using a tank reservoir and a, 
recirculation pump. The water we were using was just tap water from the town of Amherst where we were located. The water was actually monochlorinated. Um, so there is some discrepancies between what we might see in the field and what we actually see in monochlorinated systems. Um, you would actually see the results magnified because monochlorine is a, uh, functions a little bit better to maintain um, drinking water quality and reduce biofilm impact. So you'll see the results of the study just magnified in the field. Um, as for the, as far as the system, again, it was recirculating, but it had a 12 hour recirculation time. So and Andrew will be able to talk about this more, but we built into the system um, um, a mechanism to draw out some water slowly and input water slowly so that we would have that 12 hour HRT. And if you wanna know more details about how to build and set up a system like this, because a lot of this experiment was designing this um, experimental setup and Andrew helped me a lot with it. it was constantly leaking, constantly breaking, a lot, of, a lot of going in and fix it, but we did end up coming to a place where it worked very well. So if you want any tips and tricks, I'm happy to meet with you or continue to answer questions. Um, you can find my email at the model, uh, bottom of the poster or visit my website. Uh, great. But did you perform any microbiological water quality tests for your- Yes. Absolutely. We and I again, Andrew was part of this. Um, we did. We used ATP, and if you're not familiar with ATP, it measures ATP. If you studied basic biology, it's present in every cell. So if we're doing like heterotrophic plate counts, we're only counting heterotrophic bacteria. But we wanted a total measure of biological activity in this system. So we measured it using ATP. Um, I don't know if I have time now to go back and talk more about ATP. Um, testing, um, but we have that's about what, uh, one minute, but you can we have say one that. more, yeah. one yeah. minute. Um, so ATP testing is we, uh, filtered a sample through a syringe filter, collected all the cells onto the filter, and then you put a lysate, which breaks open the cells. Um, and from there you're, you're now ex exposing the ATP molecule to the environment. And we add an enzyme that reacts with the ATP and creates a uh, luminescence. And then we can measure the, the degree of luminescence using a luminometer. And I think it's really emerging as a, as a test that both wastewater and drinking water are now using because um, it's a good measure of all biological activity and not just growable, uh, cultivatable heterotrophic plant count. So that's what I use for biological measurement. Um, yeah, we then, have another question coming in from Lunit. What about testing yeah. for metal or chemical contamination? That's wonderful. This project mostly focused on um, water residual and um, water residual biofilms and biological activity. Contain I did leave kind of um, an open space where they're saying that we can have both chemical and biological contaminants coming into um, IWS, especially as I mentioned, um, IWS and all water systems have leakage points um, in places where they're broken. And, and especially with IWS, when it's off, it can allow any kind of water, any kind of contaminants. We can have antimicrobial resistance entering the system um, and antimicrobials that are just in any fluids that surround the system. We can have gasoline, we can have a wastewater. So it can be, yes, chemical, absolutely, but it did not look at it in the study and it would be great if some future uh, researchers would do that. And I do want to mention, I have a lot of resources on my website. If some people are very interested in this, there's some um, longer videos that go into depth on the experimental setup and a little bit more into the methods if people are interested. Cool. Thank you so much. Maybe now it's time Thank to you, move Andrew. on to our next presenter. Our next presentation will be from Tahmina Parvin. She is the research investigator in ICDDRB. Thank you for the introduction. So welcome to my presentation.
Well, thank you so much, uh, Tamina Parvin. Uh, can I request you to, is that your poster? Okay, cool. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, you are one step ahead from me. Uh, uh, let me see if you have any questions from you, for you on the path of all. Uh, I can start with the one. Uh, first of all, great presentation and excellent findings. Uh, I'm just wondering how often did you collect the water samples uh, for water quality monitoring and throughout the study period? Do you have any idea about the sample size? So actually we have uh, enrolled 884 children uh, of, uh, in our study and we have collected samples, water samples in um, uh, at month one, three, six, nine and 12 months. So we had a total a 12 month follow up uh, total study period in this uh, full study period we have collected those times uh, the samples both the stored and stored uh, source waters. So you collected the uh, stored water and also the household tap water. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, thank you so much. Um, did you observe any seasonal variation in the water quality? We actually, as we collected samples throughout the year, it was about a total 12 month study period. So we, uh, we uh, uh, minimized this, we think we minimized this uh, seasonal variability, uh, but we didn't look at a uh, different uh, way, in different way, we did not distinguish this. Okay, interesting. Good to know. Uh, yeah, please use the Pathable platform for typing any question for Tamina as she is here today with us. Hmm. Observing none. Okay, thank you so much, Tamina, for the presentation. Uh, now we're going to move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is going to be Sydney Turner, she is a PhD candidate uh, at University of Virginia. Uh, our technical assistant, Mary Margaret, is gonna play the pre-recorded video. Thank you, Mary. Hi everyone, thank you so much for attending my presentation on the evaluation of water treatment disinfectants for larvicidal effects. Let's go ahead and jump right in. In 2019, the estimated number of malaria deaths was 409,000. Children aged under five years are the most vulnerable group, accounting for 67% of those deaths. 
There's also about 50 million cases of dengue infection every year, with about 22,000 deaths also mostly in children. Other vector-borne diseases include Zika, chikungunya, and yellow fever. So the problem is transmission of vectoral diseases, but there is a solution and it's vector control. And so today we'll be looking at larval source management as a means to attacking this growing problem. So some of you may be asking yourselves, what does this have to do with the water conference? Well, many of us are aware of water degradation that can occur when storing water in or around the home, but it can also cause a proliferation of mosquitoes close to where people live, a correlation which has been studied over the years. We know that the vast majority of mosquito species won't fly far from their breeding ground and the Aedes aegypti is no different, won't travel more than a few hundred feet away. Timophos has been the gold standard for treating water storage containers up to this point, being used in the largest mitigation efforts occurring globally. However, more instances of resistance to Timophos by mosquitoes are being reported each year. Which brings me to my research. I'm trying to bring an alternative to make sure that water storage containers in the home are not dually serving as breeding grounds for mosquitoes. I'm specifically testing larvae to see how they interact with low concentrations of chlorine and silver, chemicals known for their microbial disinfection and water treatment. I am also looking at if any chemicals used in tandem produce chemical interactions to inhibit the growth or lifespan of Aedes aegypti larvae. And so the goal is really to be able to provide better guidance as to what water treatment disinfectants and point of use technology would be the most effective in a given situation based off of as much relevant public health data that we have. And so how do I plan to measure success? So the efficacy of the chemicals will be tested in larval bioassays, which will be evaluated in terms of adult emergence inhibition. This means success is making it impossible for larvae to become vectors for the spread of disease. I'll also be looking at larval and pupae mortality. So this matrix that I have here is what I will use to not only study each chemical working individually, but also in terms of them working in tandem to explore chemical effects. For the application basic set of experiments, I will be looking at um, both the Mati drop and the AquaTap to see how they perform. So to get into some of my preliminary results, uh, first looking at silver, I'm going to zoom in on this because as you can see, the controls here without any silver perform pretty well with a 90% emergence. When we zoom in, what we can see is a dose response for emergence. According to these results, extremely low levels of silver are capable of inhibiting emergence of the Aedes aegypti, which is really exciting on our part. From observations, we can see that in many cases, the mosquito is unable to escape from its pupil casing. So this might help us discover by which mode of action a disinfectant is working against the mosquito. So the difference is here's normal mosquito. Um, and then when we look at chlorine, instead, we can see more deformation in the actual larvae. So here we can see an enlarged thorax and head for this dead mosquito, unlike the ones that were alive around it that don't look like that. And so in chlorine, it did not perform as efficiently as silver, but we're still seeing promising results as far as low concentrations being able to affect the growth of mosquitoes. And so really quickly jumping into then our application-based experiment, I tested natural waters, as you can see here, collecting water from the Dell Pond in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and I tested it with the Mati Drop, which is a silver-based point of use water treatment technology, and the AquaTab, which is chlorine-based and the two in tandem. So the results here portray day five and day 10 of those results. The silver money drop did not perform as well as we would have hoped in this particular instance, but the AquaTab on the other hand performed on par with how the free chlorine acted on the larvae in previous experiments. Um, the exciting result though, is that, when, what, that what we captured here is possibly a synergistic effect with the two point of use water treatment technologies being used together um, were greater than the sum of each individually. And so my major takeaways here is water treatment disinfectants are effective alternatives to temifos to treating water storage containers for mosquito larvae. We know that community engagement plays a major role in the effectiveness of any given intervention to having an intervention that is able to serve multiple purposes that might help to increase buy-in for using the intervention. We do see signs of synergy, so we're gonna take uh, keep, continue to look closely at that. And we'll also keep moving toward our end goal of providing communities with better information on treatment options that best match their situation.
Uh, great presentation. Uh, very informative and colorful images. I like it. Uh, thank you so much, Sydney. Mm, please type in any question for Sydney into our conference platform, Pathable. Uh, I have a quick question for you. I worked with Claudine before. Uh, uh, how do you maintain the same residual chlorine uh, into your sample for uh, the entire 10 day period? Because when I worked with chlorine before, I found that as time passes, it dissipates. Yes, so I definitely have the same thing. So I am with my results. I know you don't see it here. I am constantly um, in intervals, usually I first start in 30 minute intervals, um, am tracking the chlorine concentration as it's dissipating. So that's really the interesting difference too between the two point of use water treatment technologies I tested is the silver kind of remains in the water, whereas the effect with the chlorine, everything is happening within the first like four hours before that chlorine has dissipated. And with the natural water experiment, that chlorine dissipated even faster. So all the results we were seeing was just the effect of the larvae even being in contact with uh, chlorine for that short of a period. So um, if you were continually dosing your water, um, if they received another dose, um, that would only benefit um, for killing, killing the larvae. Um, but yes, that is definitely something we're tracking at the same time um, and probably something we could model um, in, the, in the future to see um, kind of what the, how much chlorine the larvae are actually interacting with during like their whole life, life's lifetime in the, in the bucket. Yeah, yeah, yep. Uh, now, so follow-up question will be, do you think that temperature might have any impact on your results? Yeah. And did you control for it? And do I what, sorry? Did you control for the temperature? Yes, so I have in like an incubator type setup. So the larvae live in an incubator with the light. So the, um, it has like a photo period where 12 hours on, 12 hours off. So um, a lot of my experiments at the beginning were just trying to figure out how to keep the mosquitoes alive. Um, and so a lot of it was just based off of making sure they had a happy environment and given every opportunity to emerge. And so that's why we have the control without any chemicals. And so for a WHO protocol, which is really kind of the, the, the gold standard for a lot of these experiments for kind of maybe not the application based ones I've done because I'm doing those in larger buckets, but for those larval um, bioassays that I was completing is following a very standard guideline. And so it's the same temperature that um, is kind of geared towards the specific species. And um, yeah, so, so uh, if they don't, if the controls don't reach, like I think it's 80% emergence, then you have to correct, use a, like a formula named after someone, Abbott formula, I believe it is, to correct for that. Um, but I'm seeing anywhere between every single time my controls is somewhere between 90 and like 98%. So they're happy. Um, it, it's purely gives me confidence to say it's truly the water disinfectants that are having that effect on them. Got it. Thank you. I did not work with uh, silver before. Can you briefly tell about what, like how did that disinfect or water or something? I have no idea about silver, so. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so silver is, um, and, and I worked with silver nitrate and I work with, um, I've worked with silver nanoparticles. So they all kind of have different mechanisms in which um, they work. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe with silver nitrate, um, it, um, well, with silver nanoparticles, it can actually go into like the cell walls of bacteria and kind of, um, work in the, in, in that way. Um, but I am also happy to share, um, uh, more material on that. I actually, yeah, 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 I got it. But I, so the problem with chlorine is mostly in developing countries is the smell, but mm -hmm. the silver comes with any yeah, smell so or something. Nope. Silver doesn't smell. It doesn't have a color. Um, there's a lot of positives, which is actually why my lab, um, Dr. Jim Smith's lab at UVA, the water quality lab, we, do a, we work a lot with silver because of all the positives associated with it, but it's not as good with viruses um, as maybe uh, say chlorine. So there, okay. there's pluses, uh, pluses, minuses. Pros and cons, yes. Yeah, thank you, pros <laughs> and cons, but there's definitely some exciting things um, with silver with how it works. Got it, got it. thank you so much. Uh, I think if you can share uh, any relevant materials or any, website link into our pathable platform. I think yeah. people are gonna enjoy that. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate your presentation. Uh, now we're going to move on to our final presenter today. Um, it will going to be Jerome Boyer. Um, he's the CEO of Waterlux Company. Uh, our technical assistant, Mary Margaret, will going to share the pre recorded video. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Jérôme Voya and I'm the CEO of the company called Watalux. Uh, so we are actually developing, uh, producing and selling the Wata technology, which is uh, an approach based on an electrolyzer. Uh, this electrolyzer allows to convert water and salt into active chlorine. And this approach and device is actually used uh, on the field where the access to chlorine is an issue to produce chlorine where uh, it is needed. So I would like to introduce you uh, a study that we have achieved in Benin, thanks to a project funded by GIZ, the German cooperation. So basically we have set up 31 water devices in 19 different locations in Benin, West Africa. So you can see it on the map actually that we have worked uh, basically all around the country. And uh, I would like first to highlight why the supply of chlorine can be an issue actually. So when you are far from the main cities and capital, the logistic can be an issue basically because uh, the supply can be difficult, uh, uh, deliveries are not always coming on time, you're not like always 100% sure of the quality of the product that you receive. Uh, the purchasing power can be an issue as well because the people in charge of water pipe systems have their own budgets and, uh, and it might be difficult for them to purchase chlorine if the price is going suddenly very high, for instance. So that's why the approach of on-site chlorination can be a solution for them. Um, in the context of this project, we have basically set up uh, on-site production of chlorine, as you can see it here, directly going to uh, the water pipe system. So basically we are connected to a water tank here on that side, uh, a dosing pump as well. And then every, the chlorinated water is going through the system to the to the network to do this study actually we have uh, tested the quality of water in three different locations first of all at the very beginning of the water network then at the chlorination point and the third location was the most distant point after chlorination the test actually was mainly based on residual chlorine so why residual chlorine because when you still have residual chlorine you will uh, mainly avoid the risk of recontamination. Uh, I'm obviously talking about microbiological contaminations mainly. So uh, the figures that we can show after this study, it's, it's that actually 60% uh, of the water samples that have been collected uh, before the project uh, and even at the very beginning of the project uh, was showing uh, contamination in the water. Again, microbiological contamination. After our project, it was 0% of water contaminated after chlorination. So in that sense, it is a success. But we have to balance this success with the reality because in our project, nine out of the 31 locations are actually showing other issues than the chlorination itself. Uh, in seven locations, the dosing pump uh, is an issue actually and is not working properly. And in two other locations, we are assessing a lack of water and lack of electricity. So we, we take uh, as a lesson learned as well that uh, not only the project uh, itself and the chlorination uh, is a focus, but also 
the infrastructure around. Uh, but the main satisfaction we have actually is that in 100% of the of the working facilities cases, uh, we have reached a level of residual chlorine, which is in the reference level of the country, and uh, the water is now delivered uh, in a, in a very good quality to to the people. So thank you very much for your attention, and happy to respond to to give a feedback to your questions afterward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, it feels great that uh, all the work for the poster session today is somehow related to me. <laughs> I love chlorine. I work with Mimi. I worked in ICDDRB. Uh, yeah, everything seems great. Um, Jeremy, I have a quick question for you. Uh, how much cost is associated with the uh, WATA fluorination device, uh, including the installation and maintenance cost? Or are you still figuring that out? Okay, so um, thank you for the question. Uh, as I said, actually, so you, you wanted to know about the maintenance, right? Uh, maintenance installation, uh, like roughly, because I think uh, cost is a barrier, right here, as you mentioned. Okay, so it it really depends on the on the sites where we are working, actually. So uh, here to answer your question, maybe I should uh, highlight a little bit the context of the project because the project was, uh, as I said, managed by GIZ, which is the German cooperation, and uh, they did set up everything before before we came, actually. So they did set up the dosing pump, the water network, uh, a tiny house where the operator is uh, entitled actually to 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 do the dosing and to and to check the residual chlorine and everything and at the very beginning so when the project was delivered the project was running with the HTH uh, and to improve the entire setup actually they decided to go for on-site chlorination afterwards uh, so i'm not in this context able to to tell you how, what mm -hmm. was the cost of the entire system because we were uh, challenged to 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 improve it at the at the very end actually yeah and also i worked with florian before and we actually found that Smell is a big factor or challenge uh, when you are working with chlorine. Um, it seems like your far distant household has a chlorine residual of, chlorine residual of 0.29 plus minus 0.2 milligram per liter. Uh, I'm just wondering about the nearest household from the pump. The, the, the nearest household have residual chlorine for sure but maybe you want to know about the the behavior yeah, just, of the people with the taste yeah, right yeah yeah and and uh, yes actually the 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 limit let's say the 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 average recommended by who is a rather around 0 0.5 actually uh which we assess on the ground is never uh, a matrix which is followed back because it's too high for the for the taste actually so most of the time the national regulations are, are putting this level lower than that and most of the time it's between 0 0.1 and 0 0.3 uh, so we have sometimes complaints that the, the the taste might be too strong actually so this is why we have regular tests on uh, on what the, the the level is on a daily basis as well uh, we have also partners in in asia for instance uh, uh, who has uh, developed a, a kind of alternative solution, like mixing it with a with a with a concentrate of uh, lemon somehow to 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 mm -hmm. kill a little bit this taste. So it's uh, there's not like a universal response to 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 that actually, but most of the time the project goes with the follow up uh, assessing that uh, smell of chlorine is better than microbiological threats. And uh, and this is most of the time how we go. Yeah. Got it. Uh, did you, do you have an idea like uh, how far is 
like roughly the distance from the pump to the distant household? Yeah, it's again. It depends on the sites. Actually, it might be it might be very different. But the mm -hmm. further distance would be something like a few hundred meters. Few hundred meters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we have a question for you. Uh, Please. Addressing the chlorine stock out is a win in itself. Why any systems powered by solar systems? And thinking ahead, what are the factors you see critical for? evaluating the appropriateness of the water system for a small piped water treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, so in, in that context, uh, the entire system was not solar powered, uh, but it is possible actually. Uh, it was not the, the setup in Benin, actually, but we are working in other countries, like I'm thinking, for instance, in Chad, uh, where we are um, setting up a, a lot of water devices in the Sahel region, uh, where it's all solar powered. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I believe I forgot the, the second part of the question, excuse me. Uh, what are the factors you see critical for evaluating the appropriateness of the water system? for a small pipe network. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, as you can see here on the, on the image actually with the operator, the, the water system has to be associated to other uh, plugins. Like uh, in, in the context of a water pipe systems, most of the time it has to be associated with the water network of course, but also with the dosing pump. Uh, so it, it has to be part of something bigger so this is the, the, the first part of my reply. And, uh, and the second part is a, a little bit what I said also in the introduction of the video. Uh, it's like when you want to have more autonomy, uh, the water approach can really be a, a relevant solution in the, in the sense that you, you just have to supply water and salt to, to do the electrolysis. And, uh, and basically, you, then you avoid a lot of worries related to logistic, purchasing power, and so on. You, you, you just have the, the electrolysis process taking place and delivering the amount of chlorine you need for a certain period of time. So it really supports and facilitates the work of the operator on a daily basis. Got it. Uh, thank you so much, Jerome. Um, appreciate Thanks. your answers um, now we have to wrap up we don't have enough time uh, i would say please uh, stay tuned for a uh, young professional networking session uh, that we're going to happen at 3 30 pm today uh, please join that and we have we'll have our reg regular lunch events at 12 15 uh, and the verbals are going to be at 1 30 and then posters are gonna be again tomorrow at uh, 2.45 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much all. Thank you so much all the presenters. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining with me. Um, have a good day, good night, good morning. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks everyone, bye.